Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to another Copernic uh, Friday Night Live stream, or Copernic FNL for short. And uh, I just want to go through a couple of opportunities we have coming up, um, some things you can register for. We are starting to get into some in-person uh, programs here and there. For now, our Friday night, uh, Friday, night, Friday night programs remain live streams, uh, but maybe even as we head into the summer, those will return to so in some form in person. Uh, but we do have, as you can see here on our Copernic website, copernic.org, we do have uh, registration up for our summer camps. You can choose from uh, virtual summer camps or uh, in-person. And we, of course, will take all the necessary precautions to make the in-person camps as safe as possible. So registration is up both. You can send in a paper registration form or ideally we, we have online registration. Uh, I'm going to skip down here for a sec. Uh, we also have Rocket Fest coming up uh, in May. Uh, May 22nd is our launch date. We're doing it a little different this year because usually for Rocket Fest we have a bunch of people come up uh, to our facility to both build their rockets and then launch them. Uh, we're skipping the build part this year. You're going to do that at home, which in some ways is kind of cool because that means you will be able to uh, take time to build your rockets rather than build it in the short, usually the shorter period we have here. And uh, one one definite benefit of that is decorating. So your your rockets won't be launching with wet paint on them uh, as they go up. So uh, you can, again, register. If we click here, you'll see there's registration online. And uh, that's probably the way to do it now because we're actually going to start giving out rockets uh, this weekend. So uh, Saturday we'll be at Barnes & Noble uh, divvying out those rockets. So go ahead and... Click there to register uh, for Rocket Fest this year. Okay, we'll go back here just to look at some of the, or at least one of the upcoming public programs. So this week, uh, we have uh, Victor, who you see uh, below my window here, uh, Victor Lamero uh, from SUNY Broom. He'll be presenting on uh, trail cameras, and I'll, we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, next week, uh, we have Al The Alchemy and Birth of Modern Science, presented by uh, Dr. John Swirk of BU, or Binghamton University. Uh, that will be, again, like our usual, usual time here for our live streams next week, May 7th at 7 p.m. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And, uh, of course, all of our live stream programs, we, we are thankful to have a sponsor. Uh, we are sponsored by Broom Pediatrics, so we want to thank them for their, their support. And, again, as I mentioned, today's program is called What Goes There? and How Trail Cameras Reveal the Natural World Around Us. So this is uh, going to be presented by Victor Lamoureux. And uh, you're going to learn some tips and tricks about how, how to use tra trail cameras, how they're utilized, and how they can unveil some wildlife, um, the wildlife surrounding us. So with that said, I think I will pass it off to, to Victor. Hey, thank you very much, Jeremy. So good to see everybody. <laughs> uh, this talks a little bit like trail cameras. Uh, you put them out there, you don't really know what's there, and then you retrieve and see what the heck's going on and what's happened. So uh, welcome to everybody and a shout out to Broom Pediatrics as well. That's, uh, that's my children's pediatric place and they're great folks. So I'll put a plug in for them as well, even though they're not sponsoring me. <laughs> so as, as Jeremy pointed out, uh, my name is Victor Lamro, and I'm um, a professor of biology at SUNY Broome Community College. I'm also the program director for the local Broome County Naturalist Club. Uh, I'm also the steward of the campus natural area. So those of you who are local, um, we do have some pretty cool trails over there, and I'll be showing that in a, a little bit to introduce some of the some of the parts of this. So um, yeah, this is myself getting caught on on trail cameras down here. Um, of course, I know that's going to fire on that one. And then, but, you know, every time I take the things out and open things up, I end up getting some, you know, random weird mug shot of myself. Um, and if they don't look too horrible, I've, I've kept a few of them. But so what are we going to talk about tonight? All right. I'm, I'm going to, there's going to be a lot of pictures um, and I, I'm going to give a tip. I mean, it's probably too late to change much of what you're doing, but 
Um, unfortunately, not, you know, I do a lot of actual wildlife photography and stuff as well, but, you know, um, trail cameras aren't always, um, the, the animals aren't always centered. They're not always, you know, super focused. They're not always big in, in the camera and the shot that you finally get. So uh, if you can, I recommend, you know, re recommend putting this on the biggest screen you can get. I've got a fairly large computer screen. Um, you know, it's, I'm not saying if you're on your phone or something, it won't work, but uh, some pictures might be a little harder to see in that situation. So uh, I'm going to talk about the history and background of trail cameras, you know, basic stuff um, and how I got personally going with some trail cameras a uh, little bit, barely about, you know, the basics of how they work um, more on like the basics and tips for setting up the trail cameras and then a whole lot of pictures and a little bit of discussion of wildlife on the trail cameras and sort of different setups that I've, I've kind of used. And so a, a really huge disclaimer is that, you know, on the tech end of things, go. I, I'm not an expert on game camera, trail cameras, and the different brands and what's out there. I, I'm pretty low end and pretty basic on, on a lot of that. But there's lots of good resources out there on the camera trapping and so forth. So even though I, I guess Copernic has gone, you know, somewhat national, international now, uh, I'm definitely focused here in the local community and the Northeast, you know, and then the Southern tier of New York State. So that's where pretty much all these pictures are going to come from tonight. So a little bit on the history and background. I mean, these are called various things, right? Camera traps, game cameras, trail cameras. And they're, like I said, there's a huge amount of them out there. Uh, you can get really low cost, um, you know, cameras and, they are what we call a non-invasive technique for monitoring wildlife, right? So non-invasive means you don't actually need to get a hold of the animal to do something with it and to learn something about it. So some other non-invasive things and ways biologists do things, like for example, the BBS is the, the Breeding Bird Survey, which um, I actually set to do in another month or so. And where you go out and you do point counts and you listen for the different birds and you record where they're at and how many and so forth. And, you know, similar, you could go out and monitor what frogs in your local area by listening to their calls and, and things like that. Uh, there's even some cool techniques with like with like black bears where black bears, they'll, they'll have a favorite rubbing spot where they go and rub against like a post that they put some barbed wire on and the bears will rub. And then you can go take the hairs off of that later and you can do DNA analysis of them. So but you don't have to actually grab the animal to do that, all right? Now, non-invasive, however, does not mean that the animal doesn't know the cameras are necessarily there. I mean, they're supposed to be pretty undetectable and um, like the infrared flash and so forth is not supposed to be something really detected much by animals, but I can tell you from doing this enough, the, the animals know the cameras are there. They, they often have a clue that they're there. Um, and, you know, here's this doe that just comes up to the camera and, you know, quite curious and is like, what is going on with this thing? And why is this thing here? And I'm sure she was attracted to it somehow, probably by, you know, what's supposed to be sort of the invisible flash to them. Um, so she came right up and got in the face of the camera. Similarly, this coyote coming down the stream channel uh, was, was definitely kind of leery of it and was kind of going back and forth. If you actually kind of jiggle through the sequence of these, you can see this coyote just kind of moving back and forth, trying to figure out what, what is this, what's going on, um, and eventually went by, but it was, you know, given a little bit of a, of a wider berth and was, you know, kind of like whatever. wasn't sure what the heck was going on. Um, I've heard plenty of stories, too, from other people about, you know, bears just destroying camera traps and things like that, that they get more curious probably than anything, and, and then they start messing with it. So, um, so great thing, of course, about camera traps is that they can document, you know, actually have a scientific record, not just some random eyewitness account of, oh, we saw this really rare elusive wildlife. Um, and of course, you can do this with a lot less intensive field work and in-person hours in the field. You know, you can, I mean, obviously, if you're running a lot of cameras, it can still be pretty time intensive, but um, it, it's not as crazy as actual field work to find these things and try to document them. So, that's where they've been used a lot, especially to start. Um, some of the scientific stuff is getting more rigorous with it. But for example, here's a fisher, all right? And a fisher is the largest member of the weasel family we have locally. And believe it or not, they're really, you know, I'm not gonna say they're common as deer or something, but they're pretty common now. I, I have gotten fisher many, many times at different locations and different camera traps. Um, this is the only time I ever got one actually out in the day, all right? But 
they're out. They're they're out there, and I and I do see quite a few of them. I, you'll see a few more pictures of them as this presentation goes on. And something that I've never really seen much in the wild locally at all, for example. And again, these some of these pictures are you know they're not National Geographic quality, folks. Uh, but you know, right here running along is a small weasel, all right, of the weasel family. And matter of fact, the the most variety of mammals that I have on trail cameras are in the weasel family, all right. So this could be a least weasel. It's one, it's one of the smallest weasels. Um, you can see him just kind of jump from one rock to another back in there, right? Um, here's a bigger weasel family member, um, probably uh, what they call the long-tailed weasel, or I think sometimes the other name for it is the ermine. I really should have reviewed all my weasel family members. They're, they're pretty tough to figure out at some points. And I have a buddy that's pretty good with them. That's actually worked with Wolverines, which is a really large weasel um, in the Western States and up in Canada and so forth. Um, he's pretty good at kind of helped me try to decipher these, some, but it's not always easy um, with some of these species. So, um, so that's one of the bigger weasels there um, and going along and just probably the same guy or similar guy here on the right side. Um, if you can't see that one. And here he is crossing over on this side of this, of this little pool. All right, you can see this little pool a lot because I, I do pretty good there at this at this little pool. Um, I'll tell you a story about that in a little bit. But so, yeah, so, you know, how often do you see weasels? I can tell you, I can probably count on less than less than one hand, honestly, how many times I've actually seen a weasel in the wild. All right. Uh, I've seen actually Fisher several times um, in the wild and about, but not as many times I've gotten on camera traps, that's for sure. And I, like I said, I've probably only ever seen two or three weasels out in, in the wild. And yet, I, you know, I've had pretty good luck with them, especially on this one spot, uh, getting different weasel family members. You just see this guy kind of coming along here. Another guy running along back here. Um, towards the end of March, I think there is maybe that, you know, the ermine or the long-tailed weasel actually changes coat, all right, and changes to a white coat in the wintertime. And I think that's what this is showing here, all right, the long weasel. And he's definitely, you know, if, if that was a dark weasel, he would definitely show well in the snow. Sometimes, you know, the flash can uh, make things kind of ghost-like or white. But you can see the snow is the correct, um, you know, kind of color for what would be there. And this guy's definitely not as dark um, as a weasel would be if it wasn't in a white coat. So that's you know, pretty cool to get to see that. And I've once, I've seen once a uh, weasel like this that was transitioning in the early, in late fall um, one time. So that's not something you're going to see a lot. And so similarly, I mean, so this picture is taken January 20th of 2018 at 1038. And then you go to the next one and you can see, so it's 120, 20, same basic time frame. All right. And this guy's very dark. All right. So I'm not sure, you know, I believe all of them change to white in the in the winter around here. If you go further south, they actually don't. Um, they don't change at all. Uh, but this could be potentially something else. Um, potentially, actually, I'm looking at this now again, that could be a small fisher, honestly. It could be like a female fisher um, or possibly a mink. But I tend to think of mink being a little sleeker like this guy over here, right? So mink are very, very dark brown often have a little white spot in the chest um, when, when you see them. So weasels are not easy to, to really figure out, honestly. But again, I've, and I've only seen a few member um, in my time out in the woods. So, so you can definitely get these rarer things. And in the last, oh, I don't know, probably like 20 years, I'm, I'm kind of saying, the scientific literature on camera trapping has really, really boomed, all right? We've seen a big increase and people using camera traps for scientific studies and trying to come up with methodologies to use them in that way. Um, you can actually go get population estimates. Um, if you can get individually identifiable organisms, you can actually get population estimates. So what does that mean, like individually identifiable organisms, all right? Well, you, you have to be able to recognize like, the individual, right? But again, this is what would you normally do to get population estimates, all right? You go out and you capture these animals. You'd have to somehow catch them, tag them, put them back out, then go out and do a thing again where you try to recapture them and use some math and so forth, and you get what we call a mark recapture population going. Um, you can basically do that with the camera traps if you can tell who the animals are, all right? So, uh, male deer in the fall, you know, with their antlers, their antlers are usually pretty distinctive and you can tell individuals. Um, spotted cats, you know, your bobcats, your jaguars, ocelots, different things like that. 
even our local skunks, you know, they have a lot of difference in their stripe pattern. You know, how much white is on them, how big the white is. Um, sometimes it's two strips, sometimes it's one big strip, sometimes it's one small strip. You know, there's actually a lot of variability in skunks. So you could kind of figure out a local skunk population and basically do sort of the math for market capture using captures of animals on the camera, right? So, you know, here's some antlered deer, you know, the male deer. These guys have to be, you know, pretty spectacular, honestly. These are up, up on the Sunny Broom trails that I'm the steward of. Uh, and this is when I first started with trail cameras, about 2017, actually. I mean, I'd played with them other times. and even had an old film one. But, you know, with the digital now, it's really great. You know, you can have it out there for a long time. You don't need to change the film. You know, you can have a big uh, flash card in there that, you know, can take quite a few pictures and change it out less frequently. And then, you know, just bring home and instantly see what the heck you got and what's going on. But these guys were spectacular bucks uh, for that area at that time and pretty, pretty recognizable. Um, here's some later in the fall. Uh, and again, this is pretty much one day apart, almost 24 hours apart on this, on the same location, same camera. And, you know, you can definitely tell that guy's different than this guy, right? This guy actually had a really interesting wide spread, kind of flat wide, which I don't typically think of white-tailed deer having too much, but so, so you can definitely get population estimates. Um, actually, the local Delaware Ego Audubon Society has actually been using camera trapping now for years to document overwintering golden eagles. And golden eagles have a, such different patterns that you can actually generally tell individual golden eagles. Um, and there's a bigger project called the Appalachian, Appalachian Eagle Project. And they've got 45 camera traps set up uh, through mostly New York State and down a little bit through, and they're documenting these overwintering golden eagles. Um, and the Delaware Otsego group uh, monitored about 25. Uh, traps and collected data. And I've actually seen a, a presentation of them on that. It's really a pretty cool, pretty amazing. Of course, they get a lot of stuff besides eagles. Um, so, you know, obviously there's lots of conservation biology projects, um, sometimes monitoring for poachers. They're using wildlife cameras. Um, there's been a lot of recent work with jaguars. And again, jaguars are spotted big cats. And so in the individual, you can recognize individual cats through their spot patterns. And they're finding out a lot of stuff about um, there's a population in northern Mexico. They are actually expanded into Arizona, New Mexico in some cases. Uh, of course, one of the problems, of course, are things like border walls, right? Um, if you're trying to keep people out, you're also going to keep things like jaguars from, you know, moving up and having uh, normal dispersal and normal mating and so forth. So trying to figure out sort of how you can maintain jaguars and potentially let them move up into North America again or, you know, into the United States uh, is kind of important. And then really cool place I've been to once called Hacienda Baru. It's in um, the Pacific coast of Costa Rica, down towards Dominical. And this guy started a great wildlife refuge there. And, and one of the things that they did there was uh, the first time I ever went, you know, like 20 some years ago, the road to get down, the main road was actually a dirt road. It, it was a horrible road, actually, and not really easy to travel. And the Costa Rica decided they wanted to pave that road, make it a more major highway. And it, the road actually bisects the wildlife reserve that this guy started. And so he was really, really concerned about, okay, it's now a paved road. You're going to have cars going much faster. Um, it's going to be a wider, bigger road. It's going to be much more dangerous to wildlife. So one of the concessions he got um, as, as they you know, designed and built the road was he had them put in wildlife tunnels and monkey bridges, right? And so what are those? Well, Here's some of that idea. Um, these, these are not trail cam pictures, obviously, but um, they're actually, they put four of these across and it took a while for the monkeys and kinkajus and other things to learn to use that, but they eventually did. And they, they've got trail camera stuff at the ends of these too. But the things I thought really cool too were the 21 wildlife tunnels built in under the road. And they've been doing some intensive camera trapping there. And, you know, these are collared peccaries coming through, but they've had all sorts of other smaller mammals, plus um, even pumas and ocelots, which are small cats. Um, and even monkeys have used those. So, you know, they, you know, it's a great program and, and shows that these wildlife tunnels actually do work. Um, and that, I thought that was a pretty neat program that they got started there. So how did I get into trail cameras? Well, 
I was the steward of natural areas at Broome, and one day uh, the lady who kind of is in charge of that grant and gives me a small stipend showed up my door with like eight trail cameras or something like that. And I went, huh, okay. She says, I thought you might like these. And I said, well, I, I yeah, that's pretty cool. All right. So so I started, um, you know, working with those and starting to put them out. Probably about a year or so after I started doing it, they actually – uh, there was a, a teacher workshop. There's a grant funded workshop. Uh, they do all sorts of different teaching things, but this one had me focused on actually using game cameras and wildlife cameras and, you know, working with students and stuff. And I thought, well, that sounds pretty cool. So I went up to Finger Lakes Community College uh, one summer and, you know, did a few days. Um, it wasn't just on game cameras and stuff. There's a lot of different other wildlife stuff, but the game cameras were one aspect of it. So actually, I did pick up some really good tips there and, and some ways of thinking about it. And then I actually got a grant to get some more trail cameras and I started using with my ecology students. And uh, so I teach an ecology class at Broome and we started trying to use those up in the trails and come up with some different studies. Um, and I've done it for two years and then, then COVID hit and that kind of squashed that for the year. And I actually did not pick it back up this year. Um, hasn't worked quite as well as I would like. I mean, we get some cool stuff, but we're not quite getting um, scientific data that I'd like. So I haven't really quite pursued it as much. But the SUNY Broom cameras in the years they've been running, we've got 31 species of birds on camera and 20 species of mammals. Um, and it'd be 23 if included humans, domestic dogs, and domestic cats. But uh, but so 20 wild species of, of mammals, right? And this is probably low, honestly, this number. I, I've easily taken over 97,000 photos uh, with these trail cameras. Uh, I, for a while, I was keeping a spreadsheet of how many and so forth. And yeah, it's it's a lot. So yeah, if you don't know, when you're in the local area, SUNY Broom does have about 115 acres of tri of, uh, of wildlands uh, behind the college. Uh, it's pretty steep terrain. It's, it's definitely a workout to climb around up there. Uh, we've got over three miles of trails, right? And so the college over here, some of you might know the ice center. Um, and so some of these cameras, just to give you an idea, I, I, I've had six cameras that have been pretty much running fairly continuously until about last year. Um, some of they, I started having some breakdowns, some other things, and I haven't been running them quite as much. But so I, I had one in this, this water tower woods on a low log, right? I had one, there's a dirt road here. I had one on the edge of the road up here. Um, I had one at this vernal pool, you know, and, and obviously water sources are really cool and, and usually pretty useful place to put a trail camera. You know, obviously when you put a trail camera up, just putting out in some random spot. Yeah, you could do that. But if you really want to get stuff on it, you got to think about kind of well, what are the animals doing and where are animals going? And you also got to figure out, well, what are you trying to target? And we'll talk about that a little bit more, too. Um, and then I had one here that was much, it was right on a deer trail. I figured, okay, I'm going to get deer. <laughs> so I set that up in, in a way that I get more deer. And actually, then I had a six camera. That I, for a long time, I was kind of sitting on, oh, excuse me. Then I had no one out by the, there's a kiosk here at the trail entrance. Um, and I get surprising amounts of wildlife on that one. But I also get people, a lot of people and dogs and so forth. I get to see all the people walking their unleashed dogs that are supposed to be leashed uh, and so forth. And the six camera for a long time I was like, what am I gonna, where am I gonna put this? I didn't seem to have a good idea where I wanted to put it. And we do have sort of a creek like, it's kind of more like a ditch, but it, it is somewhat like a real creek uh, that comes down through here. And, um, you know, there's having this little pool that built up and there was a tree right next to it. I said, oh my God, I don't know why it took me so long to figure out like that would have been, a, that'd be a great place. So I got all those weasel pictures I had just run through, you know, were taken on that pool that's right here. Um, so that turned out to be a really great spot. All right. So I'm going to, you know, put a disclaimer here again. Like, uh, so again, I have not really done any research on models. Um, I was handed a, a set and I said, okay, and that's what I used. And then when I went to buy ones for my students, those ones had worked so well, I decided to get a similar model. Unfortunately, the model was no longer, it was discontinued and that's always happening. They're always changing the models, um, you know, like with everything. And so I got ones that looked like pretty close to the equivalent. And honestly, I don't think they've done as well as those that first set. But you can pay a lot of money or you can pay a little money. You probably do somewhat get what you pay for, but there, there seem to be some real good bargains out there. Um, you know, and there are some really expensive ones out there, but you willing to let that thing sit out there. And there's people that use their, you know, the DSLRs out there, digital SLRs, um, really fancy setups. So you can probably 
you know, if you go and look for it, there's some amazing photos people take with these remote cameras, but that you're literally sitting out there with a very high end camera, high end lens, infrared beams and flashes that go off and like it's lit up like a regular picture, like almost like in a studio. Um, you get some amazing stuff, but I'm just, I'm not there. That's not something I'm going to do. You know, I don't feel too bad putting a hundred dollar camera out in the woods. Um, so everything that that's been used here that you're seeing is like a hundred to hundred twenty dollar camera probably. Okay. Um, and so I've used the SUNY broom areas a lot, but I've also, you know, I've taken cameras to other areas and, and done some other things as well. So it's going to be a little bit of mix for that sort of stuff. So how do these actually work? And I'm not good on this technical side per se. I'll probably, you know, I probably have some people on here that are way more technical than I am. Um, so I'll give you the, the basics of how I know it and, and based how it works. But most of these cameras are equipped with a passive infrared sensor, right? And basically there's, there's a lens, and there's several different ways the, the, um, the light and the heat and so forth can kind of come in. And it basically has an algorithm to detect like with, if the heat is coming in the differential that there's something there and then there's movement, it detects the movement. Um, one of the ways that I saw it explained and it, it's somewhat accurate, I guess, is like it's heat in motion. So there's something warm that starts to move that's what's going to kind of get the camera to fire off. But of course, other things can have that happen. And I got to tell you, there's, there's nothing more frustrating than putting a camera card in and starting to go through it and realizing you've got like a thousand pictures of a plant that got warmed up compared to the rest of the environment and then got moved around the breeze and just kept triggering the camera again and again and again. And yeah, that can be pretty frustrating. So you got to sometimes watch out for that. Um, and sometimes just the sun hits things a certain way that kind of gives it like a false impression or something there. And then if that thing starts to move, um, you can get a lot of those. I mean, on, on overall, honestly, I don't get a lot of that. But every now and then, too, like I've, some of these cameras have been out long enough. And then I, I go out a month or two later, and all of a sudden this plant has grown up in front of it. And it's triggering the camera. So, um, But basically with the passive infrared, again, it's looking for that sort of difference in heat. It's looking for like a heat signature. So it tends to do really well for like mammals and birds. Um, it can get reptiles if they're warmed up enough to be sort of beyond the background environment, but generally not considered too great for like amphibians, insects, and reptiles. And I've even said, you know, seen some things that say they're not really good on small birds and small mammals. But actually, I've so I've got plenty of small things um, that, that have ended up on my trail cameras, right? So for example, this is a, a little deer mouse or a white-footed mouse, um, a paramiscus it's called. And, you know, they're pretty common in our woodlands and so forth. I, I happen to live sort of near woodlands and in the wild. And these are the guys that invade my house in the wintertime. And they're, they're cute as can be. But so, I, you know, I've gotten these guys actually very commonly um, on trail cameras. And, yeah, they're small, but I, I do get them. Uh, this is a group of white-throated sparrows, you know, that, yeah, there's four of them, but um, I, I've had similar luck with other small sparrows um, and small birds, and the cameras seem to trigger. Uh, the thing I find actually interesting about this one is I don't consider white throats that common locally around here, and this is in, in, in January. Right now, actually, there's a huge influx of white-throated sparrows. Like, they're passing through now, and there's, like, you know, I had 20 in my side yard yesterday, uh, two days ago while I was working on this presentation on it, so, like, um, but I don't usually see them in the middle of winter like this. And so there's, there's a flag one right there. It's kind of like, oh, huh, that's interesting. That revealed something. Um, so what are some basic tips for setting up your trail camera if you want to do it? I mean, and there's lots of books and so forth out there. Like I said, there's, there's books, there's blogs, there's internet sites, there's all sorts of things. One of the books I happened to look at, uh, the instructor had when I was at the Finger Lakes Community College uh, taking that sort of course um, was this book. And you know, I looked through it. It looks pretty nice. It's really focusing on, on Eastern wildlife and Northeastern stuff. She uses sort of a digital SLR setup. I mean, that's why you're getting sort of these nicer pictures and, you know, and so a little more detailed and it goes into some of the natural history stuff. So I'm not necessarily recommending this book or not. I'm just saying this is one example. You know, when you go and just Google stuff, I happen to see this one. I was like, oh yeah, I remember that one. And, and it was pretty nice. Um, another good thing to have Depending, you know, if you're if you got lots of land in your own place and you don't have trespass or whatever, I mean, you could just go put that camera out there with a strap and and probably be fine. Um, but I'm in the, the SUNY Broom natural areas. We got lots of people going through, etc. 
And so in general, most of the cameras I put out, I put them in a lockbox. So this is the sort of setup um, that I have, all right? This, these are actually the original cameras here uh, that I had. And again, they're in that $100, $120 range. And these things were great. Um, they did not drain batteries. I mean, they could go five or six months out there without feeling like I had to change the batteries. Um, they were really durable. They didn't seem to misfire a lot. Um, they would do what they're supposed to do, basically. Um, and then they, those were discontinued. And a few years later, I wanted to get some other cameras and I got this. And, you know, what I thought was pretty much the equivalent model, it seemed to be the kind of the replacement one. And I haven't had as much luck with these. They, they seem to be a little wonky. Um, I've had ones we put brand new batteries and put out. We go back out three days later, it's dead. We're like, what the heck? Like, so I've had a few that just seem to randomly drain batteries. So there's maybe a little hit or miss. These, these have me browning. Um, and you, know, get, you go to browning and look for trail cameras. It's like, oh my gosh, how many models they have. Um, and these are not, you know, really high megapixel uh, types of shots usually. So, you know, I don't put really big cards in if you're going to have them out for a long time or if you're going to be taking video with it. Um, you probably want a bigger card, but I find the 16 gigs works pretty well and it's a fairly inexpensive one that you don't have to worry about too much. Um, and then I have a lockbox, right? So this comes apart and, and basically I screw, you know, a bolt into a tree, the back side of this, and then you put the camera in there, you put the thing on it and these, these are browning lock boxes, you know, and then I put a lock on it. So I've never really had one tamper with. I get a lot of people going and poking at, you know, looking at them and sticking their face in and then they realize, oh, I'm a trail camera and they make funny faces or do stuff. But uh, I, I've never really had anybody mess with it or, or trying to steal one. I've never had one lost. So so the lock boxes are pretty effective, I think, as far as that goes. So so I, I'd recommend that. Um, you know, and again, what's your goals? Um, one of the things we learned at, at Finger Lakes Community College actually was like, yeah, if you put it into a wild area where it's kind of pointing at a trail that happens to have a lot of people going through, then you're going to have a lot of people pictures. And if that's not what you're going for, I mean, who wants a bunch of people pictures, right? So like I said, I've got one at one of the entrances to the to the natural area. It's just kind of, I mean, it, it is a good wildlife spot, but I'm also kind of curious how many people are going in and out and stuff like that. So you could use that to monitor that. Um, I've already mentioned the, you know, watch out for that big weed that pops up or a flower or a loose branch or whatever it might be that could end up warming up differentially and then setting the camera off with some motion. Um, I really like the timestamp feature, all right? I mean, they don't make like a lovely, but what are you trying to get? Like if you're trying to get biological data, you kind of want to know, well, when was it taken? And you know, what time of night and when are these things moving or whatever it is. So I find the timestamp feature pretty interesting. Plus, you can see sequences of what was going on and when and how close things were together and stuff like that. Um, and then you really want to think about your target. You know, what are you trying to capture? When you read most of these things, they'll say, oh, you want about one and a half meters high, you know, like three to four feet, like almost waist high. But honestly, you're going to miss a lot of wildlife with a camera at waist height. All right. If you're thinking about just going for deer, OK, that's probably where you want to put it. Um, but for a lot of your smaller animals, you know, what we kind of learned was, you know, anywhere from 20 to 50 centimeters um, in the book I have, that's, you know, I've got an actual camera trapping book that's um, more of a scientific type of thing. But, you know, so that's between eight inches to two feet, right? You know, and our instructor FLCC said, you know, like knee high, that's kind of what he feels is the best. And I, I've kind of gone with that rule a lot, that knee high seems to be about the best and get a lot of different pictures. And it's even still good for deer for the most part, all right? Um, now, I don't often do this, but I, I seem to have a pretty good eye for kind of setting it up and figuring out where it's gonna trip. But if you're a little bit like not certain, um, it can be handy to use the motion test. So you can set the camera up on the motion test sensor and then you walk in front of it or you, you start waving your hand. Like you want a certain hole or something to be monitored, you wave your hand, right and you see the light will flash every time it picks up the motion so you can do that and then of course you just gotta remember make sure you take it out of the motion test and get the camera running at that point um which is another reason i like the lock boxes actually because once you get the lock box kind of set up the camera tends to sit in the same way every time if you had to keep taking the strap on and off and so forth you think oh it's perfect um you know i guess you know yeah if you have the strap set up and it's perfect at that point then you don't touch it again but Sometimes it's nice to throw it back in the lockbox and know it's 
pretty well set up. Sometimes you use some shims to move it or some sticks or whatever when you screw it in to kind of get it the way you want it set up. Um, and then this is actually something I hadn't thought too much of, and this was a really great tip I learned when I took that little course, um, was avoid placing the cameras perpendicular to trail or a log. So if you think the animal's be coming along a log and you put the camera perpendicular to it, you're gonna miss a lot of shots. The, the, a lot of times that's gonna get detected and it's gonna get through the camera before um, getting many pictures or you're gonna get one partial picture or something like that. So kind of wanna angle it down the trail, not necessarily head on completely because then you might also get a lot of butt shots and not really be able to tell necessarily what the thing is. So a little bit of an angle out and looking down the trail or down the log can work pretty well, all right? So just some examples of that. And it looks like my, my facing me over this guy right now. I don't know if that can move, but um, so I set this up on, a, I had a tree here and there was this log tangle I kind of like, but honestly was not a great setup in a lot of ways. Um, you know, here the squirrels just chilling there. So got a picture of them, but a lot of the animals would move along here and, you know, coming from this direction, it seemed like they would just get down through here so fast that you really couldn't catch a picture you know again this one's sitting here so you get them but then a lot of stuff like that where it's just a squirrel's going right through you get one picture of something and it's not anything that great you know i know it's a squirrel okay but you know it was something a little more unusual maybe i wouldn't even know what the heck it was so um later on i actually moved to that log so this is still the same setup i take the log out um there was actually a other log on the back side of that one that was still there but but it kind of opened this up and I got to see things coming along this log a lot better. And even this, even though it's not quite as angled down it, I, this still seemed to give more room. I, I caught quite a few things coming along this better than having that previous log there. Um, this is a gray fox. Um, and if you don't, gray fox are, are a little more woodland oriented and they actually are known to be able to climb trees. That's kind of their, their claim to fame. Although honestly, I've never seen one like up in a tree or something, but certainly I've seen them on a lot of logs and stuff. But you know, red fox could do that too. Um, but any case, and then here's a fisher. So, um, you know, was was catching the fisher on this log too a few times. So, um, and then this is actually one I was talking about in the the West Woods, I call it. And th this one is set up a little higher. This this one probably is about waist high because it was on a deer trail, and I was trying to kind of capture deer. Um, you know, figuring that was the thing moving along the trail. Um, and it is, it's, it's actually not the most productive set except for catching a lot of deer. Um, and that's not really, I know there's deer, so I don't necessarily monitor for deer, but still, it's kind of neat to, to get them. And in this case, it was a, you know, some bucks moving along here in the winter time. Um, so another thing I like to do, and again, this is your own personal preference in a lot of ways, whether you want video or pictures, I just find, I don't use video much for anything I do. So I tend to use pictures and a lot more things that I do. Um, and, you know, they take up a little less room on your hard drive and whatnot. But I do like to shoot a sequence of eight. Um, so there's different settings in the camera. You could have like, just taken one picture, two pictures, or four pictures. There's a setting that does a sequence of eight. And I actually like that because you have a little higher chance of getting maybe one decent picture out of it. Um, you have one in eight chance that maybe one picture would be pretty nice. Um, but the other thing I find is kind of interesting is that as you click through those on your computer, it's a little bit like a little mini video clip. And sometimes at first you're not sure what the heck's in the pictures. Or, and and but then all of a sudden, as you click through, you realize there's something moving. And you go, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. And oh, it's a little mouse. Or oh, there's a little chipmunk or something like that uh, that's moving through there. That all then, okay, great. So I'm going to kind of give you an example of that. And if you're on a, a smaller screen, you're going to probably struggle with this mightily. But so what happened on this, there's a little sparrow over here. I believe it's a song sparrow, all right? And he flew away, all right? He started to fly away. So you can just see him there. Well, I don't, I still don't know, honestly, how I noticed this. I don't know if I noticed the sparrow initially, but the sparrow is what actually did this. But if you look right here, all right, under this rock, there's actually a garter snake. And as the sequence goes, um, watch this area right here. The snake comes out and crawls out over the, I'll just run it back here. So watch this area right here under the rock. And here comes the snake out. 
And so that is the only time I ever captured a snake on the trail camera. So like I said, I mean, the snakes aren't particularly big. They don't tend to have much heat signatures. They're typically not catching a whole lot of snakes. Now, I do wonder if you had a place where you had much snakes uh, and they might be basking or something like that. I'm going to show you some stuff with turtles down the line where I, I can capture turtles. So, you know, I wouldn't say it couldn't be done or couldn't be used. You'd probably set the camera a lot lower. That would be one thing for sure that you'd have to think about if you're actually trying to somehow maybe catch snakes. <laughs> right. And the other thing I'd warn about here is watching out for chipmunks. <laughs> oh my gosh. I made the mistake once. I put a trail camera up really on the side of a log, kind of facing over, thinking, oh, who knows what will come along near the edge of this log or something. And oh, chipmunks. All right. So Here's a chipmunk, I mean, they're cute as can be, and, and I'll do a little thing here, I'll just click through it, and you can kind of see him hopping through here. And, you know, sometimes they blend in so well, you're looking at what is going on here, and then you do the sequence and realize, oh, there's a chipmunk, all right? And so, ah, clicking through his best. Here's one, he used to like to run down this little log here. But then it also turns out, he had a little over here. So this thing was so busy, so active, I'd get over, I'd get the trail cart, you know, the camera out, the cart out, and oh my god, literally thousands of pictures like this, and you're going, oh my gosh, what is this stuff? And I'm, I feel like I have to look at them all to some degree. So you're clicking through, you realize chipmunk after chipmunk after chipmunk. You know, the same guy just running around all day long. <laughs> that can be kind of frustrating. All right, so some other things that you can kind of, um, you know, there's a there's a thing called phonology, all right, where it's just looking at sequence of timing of things and when they come back or when flowers bloom or something like that. But you just for different hibernators, you know, if you know you got a little chipmunk or it lives in a hole in your house or you got a groundhog in there or, or you know, if you have no bear den or something, that'd be really cool. Um, you could put trail camera up there in like March or something and kind of try to figure out like, oh, when do these things start coming out again? Um, obviously just going out and finding out what's going on out there um, at night when you're not around. And, you know, maybe sometimes you get to see a little story Thing that happens. So I'm going to just go through some of the things that I've seen over the years um, doing this now and, and some of the things I've caught. And like I said, I literally have, you know, close to a hundred thousand images. So, I mean, I'm, I'm putting this thing together. I'm like, Oh, that'd be a cool shot. Oh, that'd be a cool shot. You know, and I'm trying to keep it kind of manageable and not too long. Uh, so, you know, I just have picture after picture. So I, I tried to create some little stories and whatnot. So, the first story I'm calling no shortbread cookies for Victor. <laughs> There's no shortbread cookies for me. So this one year we were having a banner year of shagbark hickory nuts. And, you know, they're falling out of the trees and hitting the ground. And um, I've seen their, their husks all over the place. And I happened to see a recipe that looked really cool. It, it was a shortbread cookie using the hickory nuts. And I said, oh, that'd be really, really cool. When I'm out there, I'm going to pick up, as I see hickory nuts, I'm going to pick up hickory nuts. Well, I ended up getting about, I think, four hickory nuts in the time I was out there. And I'm like, good gosh. And you find a lot of husks. And you're like, well, what's what's doing this, right? Well, of course, what's, all right? Squirrels are grabbing the hickory nuts and eating them. And, of course, they're also way more adept. They just climb up in the trees and get them before they even hit the ground most of the time. So you don't even have a chance at getting the hickory nuts. So here he's carrying one, and then he's carrying two. And then, yeah, this guy was carrying three hickory nuts uh, at a time. I'm not even sure how they grow. If they grow in a cluster together, like he grabbed, there's three grown in a cluster like that or how he's got this. But uh, I'll just run that sequence. So one, two, three hickory nuts. Uh, so that's why I never got any cheese uh, from, <laughs> from hickory nuts. Um, this one's actually somewhat recent um, back from this past year. And this is how the sequence started. Um, a deer butt, all right? A deer with its, its tail flag up. And I was like, oh, that's weird, you know, because I didn't get anything of it coming down the trail. It just all of a sudden there's this picture. And it actually starts backing up into the scene, all right? And you can see there's an antler. It's a, it's a small buck, all right? And there's the glowing eyes, all right? And there's a coyote there. And he, so the deer keeps kind of backing up. And the coyote backs out a little bit and the deer backs up a little more and the coyotes kind of back in the frame there. I wish these guys would come a little further down the trail, right? But there is this coyote still. And then 
the buck kind of uh, looks like it's moving to the side a little bit. This was an interesting buck, too, by the way. It had this one weird little spike. I don't know, something injured somehow or what. And even its other antler was, was a little strange. Um, so definitely an identifiable individual. Um, and there's a coyote. And then the buck charges, right? And so I'll run the sequence back again really quick. Um, you know, kind of where it started. And if you look that there's a timestamp here, so it was in the November of a year ago and, um, you know, 1.33 AM and it stays at 1.33 pretty much, you know, this whole sequence and back he comes and there's the coyote. And then he decides the deer actually charges the coyote at that point. And you see the same timestamp here. This is just the blur of here's the coyote tearing back around, I guess. Um, and then the next pictures in sequence were at 136. Just two minutes later, there's two coyotes going down in the ditch and going up in the woods. So obviously they probably did not get that deer. Um, but, and that was uh, an interesting thing to see. I know, I know coyotes will eat deer, especially a weakened deer and especially young fawns in the early part of the year. But from what I understand, they're not really much of a challenge for adult deer typically, but Maybe these guys were testing that guy a little bit. Um, so, of course, you get pictures of mothers and their babies out there. I think probably the cutest ones I ever saw were this. And honestly, we don't have it. We just have one kind of vernal pool. I have seen wood ducks on occasion. We don't get a lot of wood ducks uh, on our properties because we just don't quite have the right habitat. So I was really surprised the one year when I took the camera card out and had this mother with her little ducklings following her from somewhere coming down the creek bed. Uh, to go somewhere else and I just the sequence is just so cute I it reminds me of like the ducklings remind me of like minions or something you know the little cute yellow minion guys um, and they just kind of come through the camera and off they go all right um, then one early morning here this camera detected there's a there's a screech owl that's um, you know kind of taking a bath here um, but then the real surprise was later on in the camera so let's see about 20 minutes later, I guess. Um, there's actually three up here. These are three baby screech owls, all right? And owls go through a phase that's called branching where they're not great flyers yet, but they get out of the nest and they start wandering around places. You will you can actually find baby owls on the ground. And a lot of people at that time think, oh, there's something wrong with the owl. I gotta get it and call a rehab or something like that. No, that's just their natural history. That's what they do. Um, so what's interesting to me too, is so the, there's probably, this guy might be a red phase. It's hard to tell with the colors here, but this is a gray phase. This is what we call a red phase, uh, screech owl. And honestly, until a year ago, I'd never seen locally a red phase screech owl. I know they're, they're here, but, um, so there's the little babies. And then later I got to see the mom or the dad. Um, and it's a red phase. Uh, so that was, that was pretty cool to see. And then here's just one of the babies again, which I think is going to be a red phase based on sort of that coloration there, but the head is still really fuzzy, not really feathered very well yet. Um, <laughs> checking out the camera there. So I wish that camera had been angled a little bit lower, maybe at that point. And of course, gosh, deer. I mean, I, I can't tell you the number of deer pictures I have. Um, that's a pretty common thing to get on trail cameras around here for sure. But I love deer. I really do. Um, there's a lot of ecological problems having so many deer around, but deer are what kind of got me into wildlife to start with. And I mean, gosh, they're so cute. Fawns are so cute. Um, and then, you know, this, I don't know if this mother knew she's me on camera, um, but, you know, breastfeeding basically her, her baby here. But I've got a, a sequence on these guys that was kind of cool to see. So. So that's some mothers and babies, <clears throat> excuse me. And here's actually another set. Um, I had a box, I was trying to figure out what was using it. It's technically an owl box. I have seen one time a screech owl go in that box, but not really used very often. But this is a whole group of flying squirrels that are using it. And in June, that's probably a family of, of flying squirrels. So the other thing you can kind of do, it's kind of cool. Um, you know, you've got this camera it's set up in a fixed location. It's just sitting there monitoring stuff. If you have that running a long time, you can start to sort of like figure out like how big are some of these animals and how do they compare to each other? And 
you know, and obviously you can look at a field guide for that, but it, sometimes it's kind of cool to see it almost in real, real life, real scale. So here's just a sequence of that box again. And you can see, all right, here's a deer mouse that's running up into the box. Here's a flying squirrel. Um, it's obviously quite a bit bigger than a deer mouse, right? But the flying squirrel is probably not even as big as a chipmunk, you know, a little smaller really than a chipmunk. And then really the chipmunk looks dwarfed by the gray squirrel, right? And you can see, again, these are all the same scale, the same box. You can even look at this lichen patch down here at the bottom, kind of the same thing. Um, so it really gives you a sense of the different sizes of some of the animals that you have. Um, this is actually a recent setup I have. This is in my, actually my backyard. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of deer died this winter, right? We had a really harsh winter for deer with that 40 inches of snow we had at one point. And we had long sustained snow cover that, you know, and there's not a lot to eat locally for deer anyway. They've really overbrowsed everything. So I ended up with two dead deer just in my yard. And so I just kind of put them out back. And of course, being the biologist, I put a trail camera on them. And so ended up with some, you know, pretty cool sequences of things. And again, a fisher, um, raccoons were there a lot. Um, this is a gray fox. This is a red fox. Now, these cameras are so wide angle to that, you know, even a little bit of difference in how close the camera can really change the perception of size. So this red fox is actually a little bit closer and he looks quite a bit bigger here. But honestly, a lot of the pictures I saw, I was surprised. The red fox didn't look that much bigger than the gray fox, honestly, in a lot of the sequences. So in any case, you can kind of see on the gray fox is probably about the same size as Fisher. And actually the raccoons are, can be huge. Um, the, the raccoons are on the scale of about the size of a fox a lot of times. And, um, they're pretty big. Um, and then here's another sequence I've got where so again, this is that pool. And if you kind of just look at the rocks back here in the center, I'll toggle back and forth. All right, so this is a coyote and see the rocks. Um, and there's this kind of distinctive little peaked rock here that kind of sticks up. But then here's a gray fox, all right? So the gray fox is a little bit beyond that peak, but not by much. And um, again, kind of toggle back and forth, you see the rocks, they're the same size, right? It's the same picture. Look how much smaller the gray fox is compared to a coyote, all right? Um, and there's the two kind of side by side in the pictures. It, it's a pretty big difference. Again, you know, the fox is a little bit further back, so it's going to be a little smaller just from that, but not anywhere near what we're seeing there for a size difference. So that was kind of neat to see. And then here's some, uh, some birds that were bathing. There's some cool hawks. And this guy was unfortunately way on the side of the pool and in the shade. All right, but that's actually a sharp shin hawk, which is a small, what we call an occipiter. They're actually bird hunters. They go after small birds. Um, same with the Cooper's hawk, but they, they look very similar. But, um, and the scales are pretty close to the same here. Uh, but you can see that the Cooper's hawk is quite a bit bigger than a sharp shin hawk. Um, and that's one of the ways you can tell them apart, but there's actually some overlap there. Um, and then here's an immature red-tailed hawk. And you can kind of see how much bigger a red-tailed hawk looks compared to some of these smaller occipiter hawks that are out there. All right, and then I, again, I've got lots of deer pictures. I was gonna do sort of an antler growth one for this one, but honestly, I didn't have it organized well enough to like kind of have an individual deer through the, through the season to show the growth. Um, but most of you probably know that um, you know, they start off in this thing called velvet. Now this guy's already lost that velvet. He's just a little small spike buck. Um, but here's one early, all right? So this is in May. This is only, what, a little over a week away, all right? And here's a buck that's got, you know, he's just starting his antlers, all right? And they're in this, this velvet, which is the blood supply that nourishes that bone that's gonna grow on their head. And, um, you know, just starting out. And here's a guy that's growing a little bit bigger, you know, in, in July, they're getting a little bigger. That guy's particularly big buck, I don't think, um, might end up actually just being a, a spike buck, all right? But then I showed you these monsters that I had, and that's August. And look how giant the racks are already, right? And so then, of course, what, what happens? They go and they do buck rubs. They, they polish those horns. At some point, the belly gets itchy, the, the blood supply dries up, and they go and tussle with branches and, and small saplings to strip that velvet off. Um, so actually, I should in a different sequence. So here's 
earlier in the season, you know, they're still growing out and these guys are getting some pretty decent racks already uh, by June. Um, and then, like I said, they end up getting all that stuff off of there and you got some, some big bucks. And actually the, this guy, this guy had such a distinctive rack along with, he had two other buddies hung and hanging out with him that year. Um, and some of the maintenance guys were doing some help, helping me out with some work out there one day. And we got talking about the bucks and it was just past hunting season. Like, oh yeah, a friend of mine. So they started showing me pictures like, oh yeah, that's that one from the trail cam. Oh yes. Uh, so I know how two of them actually got killed off property by, by hunters. So, but yeah, they're pretty distinctive. And then my, uh, my side gig I have is actually, I, I do some work with turtles in the Susquehanna river and here in Vestal, um, a species called the map turtles. And so I'm out kayaking a lot and trapping turtles and monitoring turtles. And one of the things that was mystifying me one year was on some of the logs where um, I would work and set up traps and do different stuff. I was getting all these shells um, from shellfish. Like, well, what is, what is eating these things? You know, what's after them? So um, I had another log that a lot a different one than this one that was showing up with a lot of shells. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to put a trail camera on there. So I took the lock box and actually the base plate and a little different than I would with a tree. Um, so this is actually one of my turtle traps. And that's, you know, me kayaking along there, kind of checking traps and whatnot. But sure enough, um, I'm able to actually get turtles on camera too, which was cool. Um, interestingly, a lot of times I don't necessarily get them, it appears, when they're coming out of the water because, again, their temperature is probably about the same temperature as the water at that point. But after they've been up for a little while and they're basking and then they start moving, you know, their temperatures are above the ambient temperature at that point, And it appears at that point they, they trigger the camera. So, um, so there's some map turtles for you. Um, and then you get some other random stuff showing up. That was kind of fun. Um, you can notice this timestamp is incredibly screwed up. I should go back. Yeah. So that timestamp is all right. And this was the same year. And I think what happened if, you know, one of these ones, this is another trick or tip that I should probably put in here somewhere, but if the batteries die on you or something goes wonky and you have to put the batteries back in or something loosened up and it wasn't working for it. Well, you got to remember to reset your times and all that stuff. And I obviously did not um, on that camera at that point. So um, that happens. Um, but anyways, this is a, a double crested cormorant, which are more and more common in our local rivers. Here's actually a, a group of three that was hanging out there. Um, but again, I don't think they're the shellfish eaters. And then this guy showed up, which is one of our weasels. Again, this is a mink. And mink are very, very aquatic, very, very good uh, usually associated with wetlands and water of some sort. Um, I would love to get an otter sometime. I, I should really try to trap more down by the river with camera trapping and just try to get an otter sometime. But anyways, this guy was pretty cool, but did not appear to be my fish eater either. And then he was just here going to dive off. Again, that nice dark kind of chocolatey brown is a good sign for mink. And then uh, a muskrat showed up one night and uh sure enough one that he shows up and he's got a shellfish in there and it turns out it's the muskrats and i really didn't know muskrats would eat shellfish uh so i learned something for sure and actually after i, I put this out on our little local nature list server, i was talking about this and somebody you know just go, sent me a thing and said oh yeah here it is and they googled it and yeah sure muskrats will eat shellfish apparently so that new to me i always thought they were mostly vegetarian um but so all these shell piles were actually coming from this muskrat all right so back to my little creek um area there with the little pool i do get a lot of bathing birds um and you know here's a groundhog that showed up probably to get a drink and then here's a red squirrel over here getting a drink and um I, I've gotten a lot of birds, actually. This is like a natural bird bath. I mean, I showed you the pictures of those different hawks that were in here. Uh, so a pair of cedar wax wings bathing. Sometimes you get a whole sequence, you know, with the water all blowing and shooting up and stuff. You don't even know what the heck it is hardly for a while. Um, and here's a blue jay doing his bathing. And robin. Uh, this was interesting. So here's an adult robin and really camouflaged right is a juvenile robin right so this is in october and you've still got this, this kind of you know youngster robin that's getting to maturity 
Um, the adult decided to want to take a bath. And then over here, a flicker showed up, a northern flicker. So I don't know, the northern flicker is just like watching the bath, I guess. I don't know. And uh, so the robin's doing his bathing, the sort of chilling out there, kind of observing. I don't know. Maybe he's trying to learn how to bathe. I don't know. Um, but I thought that was pretty cool to get the two species at once in the camera. And that actually happens more than you think, where you might have a couple species sharing the camera. Uh, for example, here again, here's a robin bathing again, and here's a blue jay um, hanging out on the side. And then, like I told you, the, the mom or dad screech owl, that happened to be a red phase. Um, I, I actually get, the, the first owls, I, I had a lot of owls actually bathing in this, um, a lot of screech owls. Uh, mostly nighttime pictures. And so it was really cool to get this early morning shot um, a few years ago. And then to actually see the kids uh, was really pretty cool. So actually, after we saw this, um, luckily, I, I guess I pulled the camera card early enough or recent enough that I realized this. And me and a few friends went out and we actually found the family um, kind of doing stuff one e evening early out there. It was pretty neat to see. So here he or she is, you know, hanging out and bathing in the water, getting themselves a little bath. And I thought that was pretty cool. And of course, raccoons love water. So I can't tell you how many pictures of raccoons I have going up through here. Sometimes some day shots, but not too often. Um, and I've had up to four at a time, you know, going through here. Obviously, it's probably a family um, hanging out. And of course, deer. So, you know, if you've got a little pool like this in a creek or something like that, um, Wow, it, it can really be a magnet and it can draw a lot of things to it and you can get some really pretty nice shots. Um, so then this pair of mallards showed up a couple of years ago and, you know, again, not great duck habitat, but then for mallards actually we have some decent stuff that they, they don't mind too bad down a little further. And the female is getting a drink here. And this turned out to be sort of like a bar scene here. And um, yeah, the, the, this is, you know, about right now and the, the the male ducks trying to mate with the female duck um I assume that was successful and then the afterwards and um i actually did see some baby ducks not too long after that that year i think so um i guess they were successful and every now and then you catch stuff you're like oh my gosh <laughs> you know how did that get caught on camera and so here's that you know a screech owl again that was had been bathing and and you know flies off and you're like whoa that's kind of You've probably seen some of these pictures that sometimes are on blogs and whatever, like these really strange things captured on trail cameras. And a lot of times just artifacts of the way the flash works and other things. But yeah, so it's pretty cool to kind of get that. Um, I've actually captured a great horn. So again, this great horned owl flying in um, up at the Vernal Pool trail camera. And a different time um, it landed and I've, gosh, I really thought it probably had some food or something or caught a mouse shunt, but it didn't see like anything that looked like it caught. But this is a different section and, you know, okay, great horned owls. I'm catching owls on trail cameras. Um, again, that's probably not that common. Um, this was pretty cool. So that's this actually a flying squirrel on that box I showed you before. And then we, he actually leaps off and he ended up, so I'll just kind of sequence that again as he drops down there. Somewhere I actually have a picture of a flying squirrel flying through the camera and I could not find it for the life of me. Um, I was kind of bummed about that. So uh, that was a pretty weird picture. But then I thought this was a pretty weird picture. Uh oh, I don't know if you can see this one. I, I don't know if I moved myself out of there, if you can still see this or not. But there is a bat flying over here on the right edge. And it was like, wow, really? <laughs> uh, I don't know what triggered the camera. I don't know how, but that was probably just completely dumb luck that we caught a bat coming through the trail camera. So, um, now, I know these are supposed to be game cameras and wildlife cameras, but every now and then, really interestingly, the, the camera triggers for some reason, you don't know, or maybe it's the tail end of an animal that's going through and it catches a few more pictures. But I'm surprised at sometimes how I get some really kind of beautiful pictures on the trail camera, like this snowy scene uh, at the Vernal Pool area and the light coming down and obviously probably some wind and the snow's blowing a bit. And I just thought it was a really kind of a pretty scene um, um, here's, I cut off the data strip here, but you know, a fox coming through this snowy scene, uh, really kind of pretty separate, different fox, another snowy scene. I don't know, for some reason, I think the snowy scenes are, um, maybe some of the nicer landscape scenes and thank God we're done with winter, but, uh, you know, it's kind of neat to see them again. Um, 
you know, just kind of an early foggy morning, not even actually that early, but in the fall, that's kind of an early morning, I guess, uh, the light coming up and this young buck kind of wandering through, um, kind of a weird early morning shot, um, looks to me kind of just, I don't know, pointillism or something, uh, kind of an interesting kind of painting. Um, almost like a black and white um, of this squirrel in the woods. Uh, again, sometimes these early morning shots are not quite enough, you know, kind of used infrared. It's kind of, you end up with some interesting shots um, in some of these. Um, kind of another surprise at the creek, you know, here it is, January, all right? And most of us think, of course, of robins being a sign of spring, and yet most people don't, but there's robins can be pretty much around year round. I mean, there's a lot fewer, but there are robins that will spend the winter um, and, you know, there it is and it's really heavy snow in January and there's a robin sitting here in the creek area. Um, just another kind of, I thought kind of a pretty winter scene. And then this one was kind of neat, you know, just after dark um, in early April. And this is actually looking out from SUNY Broom um, on a hill. This is actually one of my students uh, setups that they had done. And these are some of the lights of, of Binghamton and such down there. And you can see a little bit of the sky glow and whatnot. But I thought the next picture was even cooler because what triggered that was the coyote. And I just thought that ended up being such a kind of a neat picture, honestly. Uh, I really like that one. So, um, and to kind of finish that sequence up, uh, you know, just this young buck, you know, we're just a couple of weeks away from kind of the time this picture's taken and I can see the May apples starting back in here and the, the greenery that's coming on in the woods. And I just think that's kind of a, a neat scene too. Yeah, you're not always gonna have your animals centered in your trail cameras. You're not always gonna get the best angle from this, but sometimes I think they kind of create their own little artistic slant. Um, and then recently, um, that, that, that deer thing I was talking about, I've never actually gotten a black bear on camera anywhere. And uh, I've never actually had one in the in the broom trails, which I know they've got to be up there, but I've never really seen much sign. But so literally just um, a couple weeks ago, I ended up with three bears, at least. I think there's actually four, but the sequence doesn't quite show it. So this camera's kind of set up, not in a good way to have an animal as big as a bear come kind of through it. Uh, but anyways, this is probably a mom and her two or potentially three um, these would be like kind of like two year old cubs. They're going to hang out one more year with her and then they're going to be gone and she'll have a new set next year. Um, one thing I do want to point out, I told you this was just a couple of weeks ago, but you'll notice um, apparently April's not long enough for me to get down that it's 2021. <laughs> so when I set up the camera, I botched the year, I guess. I just noticed that the other night putting that, putting this, this slide in. So that's actually what I've got for you tonight, um, and I'm, I'm perfectly willing to take questions, and my understanding is the live stream, the questions come in, and it takes kind of a five to ten second delay. So I'm actually going to play a little game now called Can You Find Me Now? And if you guys have questions that you want to put in, uh, that will be fine, and I guess Jeremy relays them to me. Um, but I'll put the first slide up, too, so you can throw an answer in if you can describe what, what's in the picture and where it is. Um, but also, if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to answer any of those. And then if we got answers to the what, what's in the picture, that will work, too. Yep, so I'll, I'll monitor the, uh, the chat here for you and read out any, any answers that, or questions that come our way. <clears throat> so, yep, and feel free to, to input any of those in the chat right now. Now, I, I actually wrote down a couple myself uh, to ask you. Great. So uh, while we wait for others to, to submit, uh, my, my first one was uh, on your cameras, can you, can you access the images uh, wirelessly at all? Or is it you have to go to them? Yeah, no, mine, no. Um, I, don't, I don't, again, I'm not an expert on those things. My bet is you'd be paying quite a bit more. Um, and I think they sort of have to have their own like cellular plan type of thing. So yeah. I think I think the expense would get, um, you know, up there quite a bit. 
So I I don't know much about those, but I've never I've never had the chance to use those. But yes, you can get ones that would actually, you know, like send them up and you could retrieve them remotely completely, which I imagine for some studies would be a really great thing. Um, now I wonder too, like, okay, it'd be great to put those up in a really remote location or something where you can't access very easy. But then again, I don't know how well <laughs> cell service and what would be right. in some of those years either. So kind of a double-edged sword, I guess, in that way. But um, I, I like to go out and collect the card and monitor it. And actually, I, I kind of forgot to say this line somewhere in there, but you know, it really is like Christmas morning, you know, when you get the camera card and you come back to your computer and you stick it in, you're like, what, what happened? You know? Um, like I was shocked. Like I went and retrieved the camera card, like about a week after I put it up on the, on the dead deer back there. And I instantly had gray Fox, red Fox, Fisher, um, you know, like, and raccoons, you know, and I got one shot of the raccoon sticking his tongue out of the camera, which was pretty funny. But, you know, I mean, it, I was like, holy cow. And then, like I said, just, you know, the last time I pulled it, there's the black bears. Like, I mean, that's literally 100 feet or so behind my house. And uh, so the other thing actually that's kind of interesting is uh, I've got a buddy. I was going to try to use some of his stuff, but I just didn't want to try to work in video feeds and all that, too, into this. But uh, he uses his ring doorbell as basically a game camera. Yeah, so he lives out. He's got a bunch of woods around him. He's actually just outside of the, you know, kind of the edge of the city limits of Binghamton, and but a lot of wild land stuff. And so he's got a ring doorbell in his front, and he decided to put a ring doorbell in his back. And and he gets wildlife. He gets gray foxes running through. He gets he gets all sorts of things that wow. actually show up probably higher quality than these trail cameras uh, that I'm using on the ring doorbell. And of course that gets fed to his phone and whatnot. So. Um, he actually just had a bear that came wow. through and was uh, semi destroying his feeder. And actually, it was pretty good. Didn't really destroy his bird feeder. Um, and but then, it, ironically too, he had just put up a, a game camera out as well. So he got the bear from his ring. He got it from a trail camera, and then he actually happened to see the bear. It was six forty-five in the morning. He was getting ready to go to work, and he got it on his iPhone as well. <laughs> so he got like great coverage of this bear, which was pretty cool. Wow, that, yeah, that, that, that's fascinating. I was going to ask, like, because we have a sort of a security camera at home and it would like, you know, it'll ping if like our cat moves across it or something. It'll ping our phones <laughs> and notify us. So that's that's cool. Like the, the ring doorbell is in, ingenious for that. <laughs> uh, I wonder if anything's ever come up and push the button. <laughs> <laughs> Besides the yeah, camera. I mean, so he's got him set up in such a way he gets a pretty good amount of wildlife on him as well. So. Wow. That's yeah, so it's kind of neat. Um, well, okay, so great. It's good to hear that there there are options out there, but like you said, expensive ones. <laughs> so if you're well, starting, yeah, and again, I don't, I haven't done the research on that, so I can't say they'd be really expensive. But I imagine you're starting, you're going to add several hundred dollars. It'd be my bet. I, I don't know. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, it looks like we have some questions coming through in the chat. Quite a quite a few here. So, uh, let's see. Denise Peterson is asking, uh, do you find there's more activity at night than during the day? I would say definitely yes. Um, well, of course, it depends what you're trying to get, right? I mean, I don't get a lot of birds on camera at night, except like those owls I showed you. Um, I actually want, I have a really neat shot from this picture here that um, right at like dark dusk evening, um, a woodcock was actually, and again, woodcock's a pretty hard bird to see for a lot of people, except in their, in their mating time when they have these crazy displays. But the woodcock was, you know, kind of hanging out at the pool here, but it was, it was really a dark picture, pretty grainy, but I was like, that's a woodcock. That's pretty cool. So yeah, as far as your mammals go, I mean, you know, you're gonna get a lot of deer pictures during the day and stuff. Um, and like I said, I, I had that one fisher picture today, but every fisher picture I've ever had has been at night, except for that one. Um, most of the weasel, pick, you know, I mean, you will get stuff, but I would say most of your shots are going to be, you know, more at night and there is different flash technology. I mean, there is, you know, more of like a white light types of flashes you can get, but of course that's going to be more, uh, and so that would give you more color, you know, it wouldn't be that sort of black and white look that the infrared flash does. But of course that also is going to be more likely to like startle the animal or, you know, not be quite as natural, you know, a bright flash going off type of thing. Um, so yeah, but so yeah, I would say definitely more at night than during the day, probably. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually sort of 
one of my other more, I guess, more comments than, than questions, and it sort of leads from what you were discussing there, is uh, if we were interested at Copernic at setting up a, a trail camera of some kind, because um, we do get a fair bit of, of wildlife. Uh, I can here, imagine. It would make sense, I think, for us to do, do it at night, just because not, I mean, we'll get deer for sure during the day, but I have really not seen much else, at least on our uh, site. Um, yeah, I bet you have a lot more up there than you would think. That's that's yeah. the cool thing about these. You start putting these out and you realize there is a whole world going on while you're not really paying attention. And, of course, the great thing about these is 24-7, 365. I mean, as long as they're operating, you know, I mean, and like I said, that first set I had, I, I swear I could go five or six months, which was crazy. I mean, I don't think a lot of people thought they could, but I didn't have to change batteries as much as you would think, um, at least on that one model I had for a long time. And so, you know, you can have those things out there and go check them in a month if you want to and just see what the heck's going on. I mean, of course, if you send, end up with thousands of pictures, it gets, uh, it gets a little burdensome to get through them sometimes. But, you know, you kind of create your own little workflow on that and check them out, you know. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking like um, so it'd be interesting to see if anything, anything interacts with our science park, for instance. Yeah. <laughs> just, just that's brand new. And I'm sure early on it would have been even cooler just because it was it was brand new at the time like oh what's this <laughs> something goes yeah. explores that um, would have been interesting has anybody found the the critter in this picture yet <laughs> so i can move on to another one uh, it's actually not super hard but i overlooked it forever when i did i was like what is in this picture <laughs> so i wasn't looking in the right area at all yeah i, I don't see anyone that's that okay that's answered lots of questions still but <laughs> no. oh good that, well, let's fire away on questions i'll reveal this one i'll move to the next one so there's just there's a gray squirrel right there on the on the corner uh kind of blended in with the rocks i think i think the other thing is people when people take pictures right we we tend to put everything in the center so i think on trail cameras one of the things you got to start figuring out is well, don't always look in the center. You know, you're going to have things that are showing up in other parts of the frames, you know, and uh, sometimes that's, you don't notice those as well. So I'll, I'll put the next picture up. Um, actually, this one's fairly, that's a gray squirrel back here too. So I'll, I'll put the next one up and let that one sit. For, that's a little more challenging. So what, you got any more questions, Jeremy? Sure. Uh, let's see. I don't want to skip over any. Uh, I, I also want to say a lot of people saying a great, great presentation. Um, oh, thank you. So lots of th lots of appreciation there. Um, going on to the next question, though, uh, looks like their name is Nether Mapping, something like that. Um, says, uh, and then I think you answered this before, but uh, how much do these cameras cost? Yeah. So, like I said, most. I mean, I think you can find them as low as sixty. <laughs> I do think you get some of what you pay for, but the quality you're seeing with the ones I've been showing, I think they're around a hundred, hundred twenty dollars. You know, that's probably I think you can do pretty decent if you just want to be casual and you know have a camera out there. Um, the the lock boxes, they aren't super expensive, and you know you kind of buy them for the brand that you have. I mean, uh, and I think that's kind of like insurance, right? You, you you're much less likely to get stolen with a lock box out there than so probably. $100, $150, you can get everything kind of going and, you know, get your batteries and all that. But, and if you have a flash card just laying around, you know, so, but I mean, you can get way more expensive. I mean, there's top brands that are, you know, like I said, probably close to a grand, you know, but I, I don't, <laughs> I'm a little leery of leaving a grand camera out there in the woods. I, maybe that's why well, nobody steals mine because they're only $100 cameras. If they saw like a nice Reconyx, which is one of the high end ones, maybe they'd be more willing to try to pry that lockbox off the tree, you know, and get some bolt cutters. <laughs> All right. Uh, so actually, I think I see some answers. People are saying chipmunk. in this. Yeah. Case. Yeah. There is, that's good. Good eyes. There's chipmunk back here in the, the right edge. So good job. I'll move on to another one. I think this one's a little trickier, but so let's people try to get that one. All right. Challenge everyone. And going on to the next one here, uh, let's see, Patina Green asks, uh, do any of the trail cams have a, a pre-capture to capture pictures before the cam detects motion so you don't just get the tail end of the sequence? Uh, well, a lot of them do. They're pretty good at trick. They, you know, they have a certain zone. 
Um, sometimes you do get triggers where something probably triggered it and it just never quite came into the actual camera. So, um, so you do actually get, you know, there is a delay and that's, there is, there is a frustration to me on some of that. Like, actually, I believe these cameras that I was using all these years, the lowest I could set it was a five second delay, which is kind of frustrating. I, you'd kind of want to fire as soon as it really detected something. Um, I believe the next set I got has like a one second delay. Um, so those are a little bit better. And, and so that is adjustable. I've never quite understood like, why would you put it on like a minute delay? Like I've never, I mean, but you can do that. But I'm always like, why would you do that? Like, I don't understand. To me, it's like, you want to fire when the thing's there, right? And yeah, I want, yeah. <laughs> um, but a lot of these cameras too, you can also do um, time sequences. I actually thought that's maybe she was gone. So you can set it up to take a picture every whatever hour, every few minutes, every whatever. You can program those, even these models. Um, I've never really played with it much, um, but you can set that up to take. So at one point I was, I was telling my students, why don't you program it to at least take a picture? You know, even if it takes one an hour, um, that's only 24 pictures, you know, and then you also have it set to trigger when anything comes into it. Um, and that would at least give you a recording of sort of like what the temperature is, what the weather conditions like, like, you know, it could kind of give you some data to kind of correlate like, okay, we got this sort of time. We don't see any animals, but then it hits these times all of a sudden all the animals are around and this was the weather going and whatever. You can kind of maybe, you know, look at that a little bit. So, but I haven't done a lot with the time lapse. So some people like, like if you had a big field that the deer like to come feed in and they're kind of always there or, you know, or you kind of figure out like, well, what time are the deer feeding? But you don't always want them triggering the camera. You could just set up as a time lapse, kind of looking over the field and have it take a picture every hour or something and, you know, see how many deer are there at any given time. So there are some different ways you can, you can play with some stuff like that. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Next one. Oh, wait, uh, people are saying red squirrel. Yes. And it's got, got some sharp eyed viewers out there. Sometimes like I'm looking through these things and like I said, sometimes it's that sequence of motion that alerts me to what the heck is in the thing at all. And that guy really is blending in. So that, that's good. Good catch. I think that's I got one more here. I actually, I guess think there's at least two more, but so are there any other questions while we yeah. wait for our sleuths? <laughs> so, Oh, we did that one. Uh, lots of messages coming in. Very cool. Great question. So Linda asks, what is the distance from the camera that the sensor catches? Oh boy. I, I actually don't know that off the top of my, I mean, so all cameras, they, they have like a zone of detection, you know, and um, most of them sort of, sort of autofocus, but honestly, most of them just have like a really big depth of field, you know? So, I mean, they're kind of wide angle and you got a lot of depth of field, so they don't, so I, I've got a lot of pictures, unfortunately, where the animal is pretty nice and close, but it, they tend to be a little blurry um, because apparently the camera doesn't quite focus that close on some of these. Um, and so actually, what was the question again, Jeremy, to make sure I'm answering the question? Yeah, it was, what? it was, uh, what is the, what is the distance from the camera? that the sensor catches. How yeah. So I can't even, I can't even really tell you that it would probably really depend on the model. Um, and I find they're pretty good about, you know, like I said, they, they often will catch things before they're even quite in the camera. Um, and we'll kind of start getting ready to fire and fire. Um, but, and, and so what I would say is, it, you know, you can obviously look at the specs of whatever camera you're buying to figure out that. I've never looked that hard at it. I just kind of set them up and let them go. But like, it's that motion detecting a uh, motion sensor one that you can first play with to set it up and kind of give you a sense of, okay, where is it picking up? Where is it firing? You know, where is it picking up that motion? Um, that's a, that can be a pretty handy tools. Like I said, I've used it a few different times to replace a lot of times. I, I seem to have a pretty good sense of how it's going to work and pick up things, but sometimes it, it is handy. Um, like for the deer I put out back, I was really trying to figure out, okay, you know, I've got the deer here. Is the camera covering the deer or not? You know? So I kind of was off the side and waved my hand. I was like, and it looked pretty good. Like I thought I was going to get what I wanted. So I, you know, kind of left it as it is. Okay, perfect. 
Uh, and I think I actually skipped over one. Sorry, uh, Stacy. Stacy asks, uh, where would be a good place to purchase a camera? Oh boy. Well, I, I think these days, I mean, I hate to say it, but probably online, right? I mean, I, I think, you know, Browning has a site I know that you can, I mean, and truly it's, it's a bewildering. I mean, there's, there's so many models that you're like, you look and you just kind of go, Oh my God, what am I doing? That, and that's why I'm saying like, I really can't give a lot of technical advice because the other thing is like within every year or so they just, they roll out another camera. Like I said, between the years I got the first set and, and like, I really wanted that set again because they really did perform great. I mean, they were out there two or three years, you know, just changing out batteries and cards and really performed well and did not eat the batteries. Um, and then, like I said, the next set I got, which I thought was sort of the equivalent, you know, replacement, uh, I just wasn't as happy with them. Um, I didn't think the picture quality was quite as good. And they seemed, you know, some of them just seemed to be eating batteries and not lasting as long either. So, um, so I, you know, I think there's a lot of blogs and things like that out there. You could probably consult on, on the models and stuff and then just find them online. But I'm sure like Dick's Sporting Goods and, and some local stores would probably carry at least the basic models, probably in this price range, you know, that $100 to $120 range. Um, I don't think most of the local stores would carry like the higher end ones if you're really interested in those. But um, so yeah, I, I'd say probably the web is <laughs> at this point the best, you know, and you can probably go right to them a lot of times the manufacturer themselves. So that, probably helps a little bit cost wise okay yeah I, I imagine like possibly if you if you wanted to just try this out maybe even use the used market could be a pathway mm. to that yeah, yeah. Um, possibly i've also heard like you know like um i think mulch tree is a good brand and i think i i remember seeing like i remember when i was at the election of course this would be again this would be obsolete at this point to some degree but I remember saying I had this one $60 Moultrie that actually performed great. It was a great camera for 60 bucks. It really did a great job. You know, um, I, I don't know if you can find that, but so you might, you know, if you kind of are really wanting to get into it and you start searching through some of these blogs and different things, you might find out like, Oh, there is one that's just a great deal. Does the basics I need for, you know, 60 bucks. And you know, that'd be great. <laughs> so the bargain hunt's out there. All right. Yeah. Uh, so people are also, also saying to answer the, the photo question here, uh, yep. chipmunk again on the left side. Yep. Right there. There's the chipmunk. And I think this next one's the last one on that one. So we'll see if we can, this, I, this one's definitely a trickier one and took me a long time to figure out what triggered the camera until it moved. But oh. any other, any other questions in there? Uh, it looks like that was the last of, of the questions. Okay. Uh, let me make sure I, I didn't forget any super important ones. Oh, there was one last one, I, a major one I had. Um, first one comment, I got to say, I, this is the entire presentation. Uh, I was waiting for a bat <laughs> just because they, they <laughs> happen to be my favorite animal. I was so happy you got one. Even I, wow. ima I imagine they're pretty tricky to get because they're so tiny. Uh, yeah, and they're not fast. that common locally, really. So, yeah, I mean, I was shocked when I saw that bat. And I hope you guys can actually see it because I realize that, you know, I know sometimes you can't move the, the little window of the person but because it was kind of being blocked by, at least for me, blocked by the window of the, you know, the Zoom screen, unfortunately. But, yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, and, I, I, and believe it or not, the other thing I think surprises probably a lot of people, the amount of flying squirrels. Um, and I've, I've got – tons of pictures of flying squirrels, you know, just going up and down logs. I, I that one with the, the deer trail, um, that one is actually triggered by flying squirrels quite a few times. Um, there's a smaller sapling there and I've had them going up and down there. I had one carrying a nut one time. Um, like I said, I caught one even better in flight than what I showed with the weird eyeball ones. <laughs> um, but I don't know why I couldn't find it. I couldn't, I don't know. I couldn't find it. So I was really kind of bummed. You. I was like, where is that? I thought I had it kind of stashed in a certain spot and I could not find it. So I hope I still have it somewhere. That, that one was, was still of, pretty neat though. Cause of the, I like the eye track yeah, that you could see. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was pretty crazy. I, yeah, so I didn't I, know my, myself. I didn't know up until like a couple years ago, really that we even had flying squirrel, squirrels around here. Um, yeah. 
a lot of people don't realize it until they get like a nest in their attic or something and, and flying squirrel invasion upstairs. And and because they're quite, um, uh, what do I, it's quite social, I guess, you, you know, that you, you can get a, a lot of flying squirrels that like to hang out together. And uh, so you can get a lot in a small area pretty quick. So, but yeah, I think they're really cool. And there's, there's actually two species. There's a, a northern flying squirrel and a southern flying squirrel. And honestly, I'm not even sure. We, I, I remember I was trying to read about this, and it, it sounds like maybe the southern flying squirrel is sort of uh, kind of like in danger. Like there's something weird. They're not sure what's going on there. I think it was the southern one. And and we, I think, are kind of in a range where we, we could almost have both of them. Or, you know, there seems to be quite a bit of overlap. I don't know. So I, I don't remember what exactly the story, but I just remember like there's actually kind of two species and we're kind of where we could have both, but I don't know how the telling them apart would be. I, I don't know. <laughs> I think there's some things you could learn about it, but I, I don't know off the top of my head. That's for sure. But yeah, they're way more common than you, you would realize. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, the, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, well, I'll, I'll have save my last question for the end, I suppose. Um, just to wrap things up, but yeah, this one's interesting. This picture, we're getting a lot of different, different, uh, answers. Oh, really? And a lot of people are unsure. They're putting question marks at the end of their answer. So, <laughs> uh, so we have two people saying Robin on the left. We have one person saying turtle and one person saying snake. Wow. Well, I wish we had a turtle or a snake because I, I like um, uh, some people call me a herpetologist. I don't really consider myself a herpetologist, but uh, but it is. It's the robin, and there's a, a young juvenile robin right back there on the rock. And just the way you know, the top part is kind of like the gray of the rocks, and the bottom part is kind of like the color of the leaves. It's it's kind of a challenging one to see. Um, and again, that's where I think sometimes the that eight shot sequence really can help you. Sometimes you're going, what is in this picture? And then all of a sudden, as you're kind of clicking through it, you see the thing move. Oh, whoa, there's what's triggered the camera, you know? And sometimes I think you probably wouldn't even know. You'd probably be deleting pictures with some stuff in it and, and just not even realize it's in there because it's just so hidden. So, you know, obviously it takes more to go through. It's eight times more pictures. But if you just take one, if it just has one picture going off, your chance of getting a good one's really lowered a lot of course and sometimes you're not going to know what was triggering the darn thing so so yeah i definitely like that eight shot sequence yeah some some uh great great catches by the the chat here though yeah <laughs> yeah they're pretty good <laughs> uh so i guess to at least my last question uh i always like to in the, inform the the audience like if what's the best way to get into a particular topic we're focused on on the ed each week so i was wondering if there there if there's any sort of community hub where people are sharing these trail camera images sort of like a citizen science hub oh, um, i know there's a lot of things like that for astronomy um so on uh, for the cam the trail cameras is there anything like that you know, I'm, I'm not that into that community, so I wouldn't know, but I, I imagine there's got to be. There, there's got to be places with blogs and forums and whatnot that, that are doing this stuff. I do know there there are some citizen science projects um, that, oh boy, I mean, I'm sure you could try to find them. I think there's one even for, um, oh, it's called Gorongosa National Park. It's in Africa, and they have a network of trail cameras. And of course, one of the, and I think there's probably other sort of citizen science efforts like this, because if you think about this, if, if a scientist deploys, you know, an array of 20 cameras out in the field and is collecting, I mean, it does take a lot of time to get through these, you know, and they're starting to work on AI for some of this and where, you know, AI can go through and, and figure out what the species is and classify it and put in the right folder or whatever, you know, like that'd be pretty cool. But I don't think that's that far advanced yet. And there's probably not a lot of money going towards that. So nobody's really working that hard on that, but I'll, there is a lot of citizen science types of things where they'll upload these pictures. Um, sometimes it does go through like a first AI pass and, and at least, and but then it has to be kind of confirmed by human volunteers that are willing to go through and say, oh yeah, that's a bush buck, and oh yeah, that's a you know a lion or a hyena or whatever. Like, and I believe this this national park called Gorongosa, I think they have some programs like that where you can get involved and actually go through and 
you know, help to try to identify wildlife and stuff. And I, my bet is there's probably some other citizen science ones out there if, you know, you really, really looked into it. Um, I mean, I haven't run across a lot of stuff like that, but I bet you there, I bet you there's got to be stuff like that. Well, it's, it's great to hear there's ways for, for people to get involved with it. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it, de definitely do some uh, research, those in the in watching the stream here, and go see if you can participate in, in this. You, get, you guys already did a great job with these images. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I think that uh, con concludes the, the presentation for tonight. I'll, I'll run through my little sh Copernic spiel again uh, at the end here. Uh, yeah, well, I want to thank you. One last picture I forgot here that I threw at the end. I just I wanted to put somewhere. I mean, it's kind of cool to have this young buck and a turkey together. <laughs> so uh, I just said, oh, that's kind of cool. Like they're friends or something, you know. So and amazing. we're not far not far off of that scene in May. You know, that's that's uh, what tomorrow, right? May first, I think. So um, so so happy uh, deer and turkey to you. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, not so much the like the prey and predator of the coyote and deer situation. Yeah. We're just like, Oh, these guys are buddies. <laughs> yeah. 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 They probably don't care one bit about each other, but <laughs> they got the trail camera together. So, you know, all right. So I, I want to thank you so much for uh, the presentation, Victor. Everyone really enjoyed it. Uh, well, one, one second. I want, uh, Oh, I, I do have one more pretty important question. It looks like from Mary sunshine. Uh, we'll, we'll end with, with this question here. Uh, is there any way to connect with you? Um, it says my, my 12 year old daughter has really enjoyed the presentation and just wants to learn if there's any way to communicate either with, with SUNY Broom about, about this, uh, initiative or anything like that. Sure. Sure. Um, actually, can I, can I put stuff in the chat? Yeah. Okay. Let me, um, so I'll actually put my SUNY Broom email in here uh so the, of course the real trick is the correct spelling <laughs> of the last name which um believe it or not is an extra credit question on every test i give to my college students <laughs> awesome. and you would be surprised that by the third or fourth test there's still people not getting a free bonus point out of it you know so it's l-a-m-o-u-r-e-u-x and then v is in victor and s is in sam although it's saunders is my and then that would be at sunybroom.edu. Um, and so that is certainly a way that uh, people could get a hold of me. And I'm more than happy to answer questions or anything like that. And, you know, I'll put a, another plug in for the SUNY Broom natural areas. You know, again, we got about three miles of trails. You got to be, you know, there is some gentle areas that are easy to walk around. In, and then some of them are real butt burners, you know, like uh, to hike up some of these hills. They're they're, they can be kind of steep, um, but, you know, like I said, a lot of these pictures were out of there. Uh, the vast majority were out of the SUNY Broom natural areas. And, um, you know, we've got some kiosks with signs and we got entryways that, you know, people can go in. And, of course, any time in the weekend, you can park anywhere and walk on up there. But um, there are some different entryways from Lieutenant Van Winkle Drive, which is the road up to the Broom County what do we call it these days? Well, it's the jail, but you know, whatever they call it, the, the public safety building or whatever they call it. Um, uh, there's also a place up in um, Sunrise Terrace. There's a road up on there that you can go up in and, and go in from that way. So we do have some community entrances and so forth. And there's some different, you know, there's different educational signage and so forth. And um, I was actually really happy if you, if you guys know about the Triple Cities Hiking Club, uh, a couple of years ago, they started the Broom 12 challenge and there's 12 hikes in Broome County. Um, it's like Shenanigan Valley State Park and Hawkins Pond and uh, you know a bunch of places, Binghamton University Nature Preserve and they actually threw the SUNY Broome trails in because they really like to go up there and, and use them and uh, so that's been great you know we've had more people kind of going up there and um, and a lot of people live not too far from that area they don't even realize there's all that trails up there, you know, and the ability to go walk and hike and the birding's really getting great now. It's the time of year that, you know, a lot of great birds are coming through. Um, the toads are probably singing from some of the pools. And uh, so, and we've got, you know, different bird boxes up, bluebirds and tree swallows and, and, and so forth. So, um, you know, I think it's a great opportunity for people to get out and get some outdoor exercise and, um, you know, potentially see some great nature and so forth too. So I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any questions about that 
or try to do trail camera questions or, um, you know, uh, again, I, I wouldn't consider this like an expertise of mine by any means, but, uh, uh, I just think it's kind of cool and fun to, to try to do it. So, uh, that's kind of why I decided to do this talk when, uh, the director Desker asked me to, you know, well, you got something. I usually come up and do amphibian talks and stuff. That's probably more in my, and I can do, love to do bird talks and other stuff too. But, um, I've been, pulling up these pictures for so long. It's like, I've taken all this time. I might as well do something with them, you know? So that's kind of how this one came about. And I'm, I'm double dipping. I'm going to get to use this for the Nationals Club next month. So. <laughs> Great. Yeah. yeah. That, that, well, I want to thank you for, for offering that to the, the audience here. <clears throat> um, yeah, no problem. So I guess with with that said, we'll wrap up the, uh, the program tonight. It looks like we're, we're done with uh questions here so uh let me just quickly go back to my wrong one there we go uh my my web browser screen here just to show you again the programs we have coming up here at copernic again registration is open for our summer camps so go ahead and you can if you're you have students that are interested uh go ahead and, and register online or we also have a paper registration uh i think tonight is the last uh, night where you can get the uh, cheaper price for Rocket Fest. Tomorrow it's going to transition just because we're, we're, tomorrow we start handing out rockets. So the admin fee goes up a little bit. Uh, so if you want to participate in Rocket Fest, get that good price tonight. Register tonight online. Um, but there will still be an opportunity this weekend if you're just not sure yet. Uh, what else did I want to mention? We talked about the upcoming program this coming Friday, uh, May 7th, on alchemy and the birth of modern science. So stay tuned for that. Again, that's at 7 p.m. And last thing I always like to check uh, is the clear sky chart just to see what's coming up in the next few days and if we have any windows at all uh, to observe. Uh, this weekend, or not this weekend, sorry, weekend after or the following one, I'll be headed up to Cherry Springs, and I'm hoping to offer some kind of video program, probably not a live stream. Uh, but Cherry Springs, if you don't know, is a dark sky area. We can, uh, it's even darker than Copernic. We can see so many more stars on a moonless night. I've never been there, so I'm really excited to check it out. And uh, I'll hope, hope to have some kind of video to, to share with you if you haven't uh, visited yourself or if you're interested. Where um, is that, Jeremy? Cher Cherry, Cherry Springs, Springs is, uh, it's in, I think the nearest town is Cowder Sport, PA. Okay, yeah, uh, okay. It's about two and a half hours away, I think. I'll find out if I, when I go yeah. <laughs> to exactly how long it'll take, but i um, pretty excited for, for that trip. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is this past Sunday, uh, which was the, oh, now I've completely forgotten, the 25th. Uh, of April, uh, we celebrated 31 years of Hubble. The way we celebrated here at Copernic is we built the this new uh, Lego set that came out. It's the actually representing the deployment of the Hubble Space Telescope. So if you haven't watched that video, that is an uploaded video to the our YouTube channel that you can go and watch. It's a time lapse of the build, and at the very end we discuss uh, some of the features of the shuttle and of of Hubble. Uh, and use use that as a model to display all of that. So that's that's up there as well. Uh, so I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. We greatly appreciate your support. support. I want to thank Broom Pediatrics again for their support on these live streams. And if you enjoyed tonight's program, uh, please hit the uh, like button on uh, your screen there. That helps to show your support. Uh, and if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, uh, please uh uh, consider that as well, because you'll you'll get the latest information about our upcoming programs. That's the best way to do it. All right. So with that said, I'm going to conclude tonight's program. Thank you again, Victor. Uh, yeah. And we will outro here. Have a good night, everyone.